I am forced to perform. I still believe there's a real me somewhere far underneath this act I'm putting on. So if I show who I am, what if they hate what I can never change? And so one more time, I step back onto the stage. I wish I could stop it, but the show must go on. It's time to begin the act. My name's Nicole. I'm Chris. Christopher and I have been married for almost 11 years and we've been together for um, almost 16 years. We had an idea in our head of what marriage would be like, that it would be easy. We'd been together for so long, we, we figured we had it um, figured out, I guess. Very slowly, um, we started not communicating, not engaging with each other and working on our marriage. I picked up uh, cycling, got into a sport pretty heavily. That took over and I wasn't home very much. Eventually we, we were not even hardly doing anything together. And it felt a lot less like marriage and more like just a friendship. Christopher started hanging out with uh, some friends that he had been cycling with. His one friend started to notice that our relationship wasn't the best. He had saw that, he decided to take advantage of that situation and had decided to pursue a relationship with my wife. Never noticed anything different, but part of the problem was is I was too wrapped up in being selfish and worrying about myself. This person put a lot of ideas in my head um, and a lot of lies. This. I, I guess what you would call a, an emotional affair um, happened for about three months. One night I happened to check the computer for an email and I had found out uh, what was going on. I was very upset, was very angry. The relationship was at rock bottom and one sure even what was going to happen at that point. I thought for sure that, that our marriage was over. Who are you pretending to get along with? But in reality, you've slammed the door of your heart to them. Who are you acting like you like and you get along with? But in reality, maybe when you walk out the door, you physically slam the door. Or maybe you've just slammed the door of your emotions or your affection or your affirmation to them. Who in your life have you shut out? It looks like they're in relationship with you, but in reality, you've shut the door and you've locked them out of your love, you've locked them out of your affection, and there's now a divide in that relationship. Look, let's just be honest. Relationships are hard. Mostly because other people are difficult. But come on, just sometimes, you can be a little bit difficult too. And so take two very broken people Take two people with a past and a mess and a backstory, and we try, to get, we try to get along, and things don't always work out like that, do they? And so what is it in your life? Maybe it's hurt. Maybe it's hate. Maybe it's prejudice, or maybe it's your past. But something has precipitated you shutting people out in relationship, but it's an act, right? In what you try to show everyone else is that everything is okay. Look right now, some of you, when I started, you reached over and you grabbed the hand of your spouse and they pulled away from you. Or you put your arm around them and they backed off. Or right now you feel a little guilty because you feel like, man, I need to put my arm around my child. But we don't quite have that intimacy that I wish we had. Maybe there's somebody right now that you're thinking of and you're going, yup, we act like everything is okay but it's chaos under the surface. I'm not calling you out. I'm saying that is the challenge that you and I face. It's how we handle it that makes all of the difference. In fact, Jesus, as he was approaching his death, his final sermon was all about acting. It was all about the act. And he was warning us, the people that gathered around him, and those that would gather in his name thousands of years later, he warned us, about the act. And so his friends and followers gathered and that became a crowd. And in that crowd were these religious leaders. And, in the, and those religious leaders of that day, um, they used rules and laws to manipulate people. 
They would judge those that didn't measure up to their standards. And so Jesus is looking out at the crowd four days before he's arrested and then put to death, and he calls them out. And his point is, they're acting. Don't act like them. And and so this moment, this sermon is recorded by one of the followers of Jesus who later in life sits down and pens out the historical account from his eyewitness experience of the life, teachings, death, and resurrection of Jesus. His name was Matthew. And the book that he wrote about the life of Jesus is later captured and recorded in the Bible, and it becomes known as the gospel according to Matthew. And and Matthew writes about this sermon, and it reads this way in Matthew chapter 23. Let's just dive in and let's read it. Here, imagine Jesus, he's looking out at the crowd, and he sees these religious leaders, and he says, woe to you, teachers of the law, and Pharisees, the, the, the term Pharisee, it's just a pronoun referring to these religious elite who think they're better than everyone, who judges everyone, they tell everyone else how to live. He goes, you hypocrites. Now, in our day, the word hypocrite is pejorative. It's a real negative term, it, it really is a put down. But in Jesus' t- time, it just meant you actors, you performers. He goes, you religious elite, you're performers on a stage. And then he goes like this, You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. And so he's challenging them on how they're living. And then he continues and he goes, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you performers, you actors on a stage, you're living out the act, pretending like things are okay, pretending like you're getting along with God and others, but in reality, Your lives are a mess. He goes, you travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Whoa. Hey, everybody, just do me a favor. Would you all just say, whoa? Whoa. I know some of you all, you didn't say it just because you refused to go along with the crowd. Um, But man, you see the way Jesus speaks? Like, he doesn't talk like that to almost anyone except the actors, and what he's saying is, he goes, stop it. He goes, Here, here's what they do. They, they put on a show. They put on the act. They pretend like they're getting along. They, they pretend like everything is right with them and God while they're judging everyone. They've locked themselves into a prison of rules and judgment. And then they invite everyone to join them. But when they come in, they're coming into what they believe was relationship. But really, it's religion. And it's a prison. See, here, here's the principle. You can only invite people in to where you are. And when you're living in guilt and shame, when you get into a relationship with others, you drag them into the prison of your guilt and shame. And what Jesus is saying is that these religious elite, they invite people in to what, they, what looks like community and unity, but really is conformity and a prison of religion and rules. And when they go in, they just lock the door. And they shut out God and they shut out others. And maybe you can relate. Because maybe in your life, you've shut people out. But you've also, maybe you feel like you've shut the door on God. And here's what that looks like. Let's put this into practical terms. Meaning, let's put real people in the place. One of Jesus' close friends and followers was a guy named Judas Iscariot. And he got invited into this religion, into the judgment. And he became a friend of the Pharisees and they paid him to betray his friend Jesus. So Judas goes about his business and he sets up Jesus and he betrays him. Here's what happens when you find yourself trapped in the prison of guilt and shame and judgment where you shut doors on people and you shut doors on God. We're going to jump ahead just a few chapters. Judas betrayed Jesus. Jesus is arrested, and this is where it picks up. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, when he saw the result of his prison judgment, he was seized with remorse. Now, most of us, anybody who's ever failed, you get this idea of feeling a sense of remorse. If you haven't felt remorse, wow, you're a rock star. 
That's amazing, but you probably will. And so Judas felt what all of us feel, this deep sense of remorse, and he returned the 30 silver coins, so he not only felt remorse, but he kicked into uh, restitution. He wanted to make things right, and so he returns the money they had paid him to betray Jesus. But it doesn't stop there. He continues, and and he says, I have sinned. Not only does he feel remorse, and then he goes through a, a moment of restitution, but he acknowledges his sin. It sounds like repentance. He goes, I've sinned, and the word sin is this word to capture the idea of, I haven't just wronged you, I've wronged God. I've broken the rules of God. I've turned my back on God, and I've done my own thing. He said, I've sinned, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. Those are your chains to carry. Those are your prison bars. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left, and then he went away. And he hanged himself. Because when you lock yourself in the prison of your past and your guilt and your shame and judgment, remorse leads to godless regret and hopelessness. Where your failures become final in the prison of your own mind. The reality is most of us live in an emotional prison of our own making. Most of us live in a mental attitude, a prison of our own making. We live behind prison bars in relationship, but a prison that we've built, driven by judgment and guilt and unmet expectations, hurt and hate, and we've locked ourselves in and we've slammed the door. But it doesn't have to be that way. There was another friend and follower of Jesus who did you could suggest at least equally as bad as Judas did, but his life took a very different course. There's this guy named Simon Peter. In fact, Jesus gave him the nickname Peter. He was, his name was Simon, son of John, but when he became a follower of Jesus, he nicknamed him Peter, which means uh, the rock. So you immediately have an image of your, in your mind of what Peter must have looked like, this uh, real muscular actor dude, all right? But Peter, uh, it, so his name literally translates, Pet, or was Petros, uh, translates um, the rock, and uh, Jesus gives them that nickname, they're good friends. Peter, uh, he's kind of like, he's like, I'm Jesus' best friend. So Jesus is telling them that he's about to die. And, and in the gospel according to Luke, Uh, This moment is captured, and Peter speaks up, and he goes, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. I'll go to prison with you. I'll die for you. I'll fight for you. Like, let's do this. And Jesus goes, yeah, probably not. Um, I tell you, Peter, the rock, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you even know me. And so then let's jump to that moment. Here's Jesus has been betrayed by Judas. Peter, uh, Jesus has been arrested, and now he's on trial. And standing in, on trial, Peter follows from a distance and gets to the outer court where people are hanging out, kind of waiting for the lynching. And after a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them, for your accent gives you away. You sound like, you talk like one of the followers of Jesus. Then he began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them. You see what he did there? You sound like one of Jesus' followers. Oh, yeah? Blankety, 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 blah, 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 blah. And he's like proving to them that he is not one of Jesus' followers. Oh, yeah? Would Jesus' followers talk like this? And he's dropping the F-bomb, and he's like, I'll prove to you I am not what you think I am. And I don't, you get it? Fill in the blank. I don't know the man. Immediately, a rooster crowed. Okay, here's the moment. Remember Judas? He felt remorse. He stepped into restitution. He felt regret. He acknowledged his sin. Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. So here's his moment. He could do what Judas did. He could lock himself into the pain of his past, into the prison of the Pharisees, in religion and rules, in self-loathing and self-pity. He could beat himself up in shame and guilt. He could lock himself in with the Pharisees, 
But Peter's story is radically different. You know the name Peter. Peter wrote a couple of the books of the Bible. There's a church in Rome named after him, St. Peter's Basilica, because it's on the spot where Peter was killed because of his faith in Jesus. At the end of his life, while earlier he had denied knowing Jesus, his life ends with his last breath being his profound loyalty to Jesus. So what made the change? There's this moment Peter encounters Jesus and he discovers the power of forgiveness. And that's the principle. That's it right there. That's what separates Judas from Peter is that Peter discovered the power of forgiveness. And for you and I, what separates one person from the next, what, what, what is the dividing line in the sand in our life is that one of us will step into the power of forgiveness while the other one will walk in the impotence of broken relationship because they are unable to experience the power of forgiveness. Why are you and I find it? Why do we so often slam the doors on relationships? Well, let me, let me just share this with you. Look, when you and I were born, we were born here. You, you weren't born free. You and I were born in the prison. Listen to this. You and I were born in the prison of our own thinking, in the prison of what Judas called sin, where we turn our back on God, we reject God, and we did what we wanted. As a result, our life experiences guilt and shame, and so we lock ourselves behind the doors. We shut the door off to God. And anyone who comes with us joins us in our shame and our guilt, in our pain. We invite people into wherever we are and because we live behind prison doors. They experience the same judgment, the same frustration, the same hurt that we're carrying and we're harboring. Look, you can only give out of the overflow of what's in you. And when prejudice is in you, hurt and hate are going to come out of you. When you've been hurt, when, when the pain of the past bubbles up inside of you, you're just going to take it out on others. And we spend our lives behind prison doors. And as a result, we hurt others. We, we, we judge others and we invite them into the same pain, right? We think we're shutting the door on them. But in reality, we're creating another prison and we're locking them in. Locking them into our unforgiveness, locking them into our judgment. And the consequence of a life of sin is that we spend our life in prison headed toward our death penalty. You, you catch this? I, I'm on a death sentence. I'm on death row. And we're headed toward eternal judgment. And so what Jesus does is he intervenes in our life story. Jesus entered into our prison when God came to earth, he stepped into our prison, our prison of sin, our prison of eternal judgment, our death sentence. He takes all of our collective death penalty on himself so that when Jesus died on the cross, he took on our sin judgment, he took on our eternal suffering, he took on the, our death so that when he died, he died once for all. Hanging on the cross, Jesus was taking the electric chair on our behalf. So that once our sentence was paid, the door to prison was open so that any of us could step through. Here's how it works, right? It's when I believe in Jesus by faith, the door is open. It's just that most of us live here. Jesus invites us to step out by faith into his grace where we receive forgiveness of sin. Our death sentence assuaged, and we are given new life. How do we receive new life? Because we are not just forgiven of sin, but when you believe in Jesus by faith, his spirit enters into your spirit. Whose spirit? God's spirit, which is eternal and invisible, enters into our spirit, which is eternal and invisible, and we are changed. God's spirit gives us new life in the spiritual place. So we are invited to step through the door, out of the prison, into the freedom of new life, to discover the power of forgiveness. And when you discover the power of forgiveness, it changes everything about our life. Now, here's, the, here's what most of us do. When we've blown it and our failure feels final, we go back to doing what we used to do. We fall back into old habits, don't we? Maybe before you failed, you used to drink or used to... Get, get caught up in addictive behaviors. Maybe you're an alcoholic. Maybe you're abusive. Maybe you were angry. Maybe you lashed out at people. Maybe you just numbed your pain through prescription, abu abusing prescription drugs. Whatever your choice of drugs was in your life, 
Here's what happens. When we fail, we feel regret, shame, guilt, and so we lock ourselves back into prison away from God. Right? We go back to what wasn't working before. And that's exactly what Peter did. When Peter rejected, when Peter denied Jesus, Jesus was crucified, buried in the ground. Jesus rose from the dead. Peter knew Jesus rose from the dead. And you know what he did? He went back to fishing. When he met Jesus for the very first time, he was out fishing. Jesus walked on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and he called out to Peter on the boat. Hey guys, have you caught anything? No, we've been fishing all night, I haven't caught a thing. He goes, throw your net on the other side of the boat. So they throw their net on the other side of the boat and um, they catch a huge draw of fish. And they go, this is supernatural. Peter goes, that must be God. So Peter goes and from that point on, he follows Jesus. When Peter rejects Jesus, when he denies Jesus, you know what he does? He goes back to fishing. You know what Jesus does? He goes back to the shore. Check out this moment, John chapter 21. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus just like the first time. And he called out to them, friends. I love that. Can you just say friends? Now the same group of you that didn't say, whoa, didn't say friends either, I know, because I'm just like you. Friends, have you any fish? Jesus calls out to Peter. The guy who rejected him, friend, I know you've gone back to what didn't work before. I know you went back to abusing. I know you went back to, you know, taking advantage. I know you went back to cheating. I know you went back to drugs and alcohol abuse. And I know you're wrecking your life, friend. How's that working for you? Have you caught any fish? How's that going? Is it giving you the fix you thought it would? Is it working for you? Is that a fair going well? Is it, is it filling your life? Is it setting you free? And they go, no. Just like last time, it's not working this time. Just throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. When you and I fail, and we stray, and our failure feels final. You know what Jesus does? He pursues us. He went right back to Peter, right back to the shore where Peter's back on the boat and Jesus is going, hey, how's that working for you? And for some of you right now, Jesus is calling your name. Hey, how's that going? How's that judgment going? How is that guilt going? How's that shame going? I know you've locked yourself in prison, but here's what I want you to know. I've opened the prison door. You can be free. You don't have to live in that. The story is this. It's not that Peter's a hero. It's not that Peter was some super loyal friend. He rejected Jesus. It's this. Peter failed. Peter wandered. Peter denied. Jesus was faithful. Jesus pursued. Jesus accepted. Go, Jesus. In your life, it's I have failed. I have wandered. I've denied. Jesus has been faithful, Jesus loves, Jesus forgives. Wow, Jesus is awesome. Jesus changes everything about our lives. So we asked the Schindles that they would share a little more of their story. Check this out. We had a family friend who was a pastor and kind of a counselor, and I thought maybe we should contact him. I didn't know that Christopher had actually already contacted him as well and asked him to come over that evening. After speaking with him, we realized that what was missing in our marriage was Christ. Uh, Nicole and I accepted Christ into our lives. Uh, realized then that without Christ, your marriage would almost not work. After accepting Christ, we uh, continued to work on our marriage. It took a lot of hard work um, to reach the point where you know, we could forgive each other for the wrong things that had happened. I had heard about Lifehouse Church and we um, attended a service and we both loved it. So since we've been going to Lifehouse, our lives and marriage has changed uh, dramatically. We now pray together and we had never prayed together before. We do our devotions together. Our marriage no longer feels empty. Uh, we feel like, you know, the missing piece of the puzzle um, has been found and, and it feels complete now. We are proof that God can, can de deliver you from any terrible situation. 
even when it looks like it's impossible. He can rebuild and um, fix any marriage that is just is being destroyed. You can't have a marriage without a solid foundation, and Christ is that solid foundation. It, it takes a lot of courage. When we ask a couple to share that kind of story, it takes a lot of courage. To say, sure, I'll, I'll air out my dirty laundry in front of thousands of people, <laughs> and, uh, and they know it's going to get viewed online, and so, hey, world, look at the mess, and that, there it is. Most of us, you know why we wouldn't do that? Because it's an act. Even if it's all messed up behind the scenes, we don't want anybody to know, and, and that's the myth is that somehow Christians have it all together. Somehow Christians never hurt each other, or that we would never do the wrong thing against God, that we would, that we would somehow have all have a perfect marriage and have perfect relationship with our kids and have perfect in-laws and, man, alive. Um, we won't go there. Uh, he, here's the reality. Christians just stepped off out of the act. We've just said, you know what? No, we're, we're gonna be real. We're gonna be honest. Man, we've, we've turned our back on God. We've locked ourselves in prison. We, we're just like Judas and Peter. Some of us have betrayed God. Some of us have denied God. And we, we've lived in the prison of our own guilt and shame, but we've been set free by Jesus. And that's kind of the point. We don't have perfect marriages. We just have marriages that Jesus has done a miracle in. We're not perfect parents. Man, Laura and I, we wrestle all, we, we wrestle all the time about this issue. We're like, man, we... This isn't perfect. Like we're stumbling through this most of the time. But you know what we have? We both have discovered that we're not gonna act. We're gonna experience the love that comes from God by being forgiven. In fact, that's the, don't, don't miss this. This is it, be forgiven. I, I was trying to think of something really profound to say. What, what's the application here? What's the point? I thought it was a super profound statement. Be forgiven. This is the key that unlocks the door. So you step out of the prison into forgiveness. Look, this isn't cheap. Grace cost Christ everything. Jesus Christ went to the metaphorical electric, electric chair, the actual cross on our behalf to take on our death sentence so that we could be set free from the prison of shame and guilt where we've locked ourselves in and we've shut the door on God and we've invited others to come with us. And we've trapped them in guilt. We've trapped them in shame. We've trapped them in unforgiveness. But we can be forgiven, which means we are freed through forgiveness from the guilt, from the judgment, from the shame. And we can walk into a new life where our slate is washed clean and we are now seen through the eyes of God as loved by God. Now, let's jump back into the story of Peter because this is a cool moment. Peter, um, they're pulling in the nets and something begins to happen. He's like, whoa, 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 wait. This is, this, I remember this moment. I've been here before. There's this deja vu moment and he doesn't quite get it first. Peter's a little slow on the uptake. I like Peter. I feel like I can relate to Peter. Um, and so one of the other guys catches on quicker. Check this out. John chapter 21, we're just gonna continue with the story. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, I, I kind of like that phrase because John is writing the book and he's referring to himself in the third person. He's like, Peter thinks he's Jesus' best friend because he got the nickname The Rock. I'm the one Jesus loved. And he goes, hey, Peter, it's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say it, it is the Lord, here's what Peter does. Check this out. He wrapped his outer garment around him. Look, he was, he was fishing. He was out with a bunch of his buddies. They're out far on the Sea of Galilee. He's not exactly wearing modest dress. I mean, he's just out there having a good time. Whatever. He's in his... <laughs> Speedo. And he jumped in the water. And he goes swimming. Here, here's the moment. I love this. G Peter denied Jesus. He's gone back to what didn't work. He's back to his failures. He's back in his regret. And Jesus comes to him. And when he discovers that Jesus has come to him, he throws himself at Jesus. Forgive me. I've blown it. And maybe for you, Jesus has come back. And you're, in this moment, you're discovering Jesus has come back to me. He's standing on the shore of my life. He's standing just right there. 
And my addiction has been keeping me from him. He's standing right there in my hurt and my hate, my prejudice, my past. I've been running from him. I've shut the door on him. But he's standing there. He's opened the door and he's saying, come on. And Peter comes jumping through the door. Do you get it? That's it. Be forgiven. Receive what Jesus is offering. When you believe in Jesus by faith. And that's not one time, right? Peter had been a follower of Jesus. Maybe you've been following Jesus, but you've gone back to what didn't work. Maybe it's time to step back through the prison door and back into forgiveness, back into God's love, back into the freedom that comes through knowing God has forgiven you. And then here's what happens next, and this is where it becomes really practical. Let's continue with the story. They, they sit down, they have breakfast together, and when Jesus, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John. Now, let's just stop right there. Jesus had nicknamed Peter the rock. But in this moment, Jesus refers to him by his old name because he's gone back to living the way he used to live. He's gone back to his old patterns, his old lifestyles. So Jesus refers to him by his old way of living. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than he is? Now, real quick, I'm gonna give you this briefly, but I, I've shared this before. So in the, in the Greek language, which is the, what this was written in, we're translating in English, uh, the word love has a couple different ways to translate it. Erotic, romantic love, sexual love is uh, the word eros. Then you have brotherly family love, this kind of friendship love, that's phileo love. It's where we get the name for Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. Phila, or phileo. And then you have this unconditional godlike love, a love that commits to and never betrays, is unfailing love, and that's agape or agapeo is the verb. All right, and so here we go. Let me, I gave you this because this is going to be used in this moment. Here we go. Jesus goes like this Do you agapeo me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I phileo you. Peter, do you re are you really going to be unfailing in your love? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I can be a good friend. Jesus goes like this. Then feed my lambs. Then give away what I've given you. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you agapeo me? He answered, yes, Lord. You know that I phileo you. He goes like this. All right. Then take care of my sheep. Give it away. And the third time he said to them, him, Simon, son of John, do you even phileo me? And, and Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you phileo me? And so Peter says this, Lord, you know all things. You know that I phileo you. And so Jesus said, feed my sheep. And there's this moment, there's this real intimate encounter. Three times Peter had rejected Jesus, denied Jesus. And so three times Jesus asks him to repeat his love for him. You, you denied me three times? I want you to confess your love for me three times. Let's kind of walk back through this process of reaffirming our relationship. Peter, are you going to commit to doing this in your strength? Or are you going to lean into my love? And here, here's the point. Here's the takeaway. When you have been forgiven by God, we share the wealth of that forgiveness with others. Did you catch that? We share the wealth with others. Peter had been forgiven much. And so Jesus says, then go out and feed my sheep. Give them what I've given you. Teach them what I've taught you. Share my love with them. Share my forgiveness with them. Here's what Jesus is saying. He goes, when I've opened the door for you, don't you dare slam the door on others. Don't you lock them into guilt and shame. Don't you hold offense against them. Don't you harbor hurt and hate and keep them trapped in a prison that you've been set free from. When I open the door for you, I open the door for them. This changes everything about our relationships. When you discover that we are forgiven to share the wealth, in essence, you've been freed through forgiveness. Now would you share the wealth of the open door with others? This forces our hand. When you step through that door, you're coming out into forgiveness. People can only be where you are, meaning you can only invite people into the kind of relationships where you're living. If you're harboring guilt and shame and hate and prejudice and hurt, you're going to trap others in that prison. But when you've been set free, they're set free. Did you catch that? You can't walk out into forgiveness and freedom, but then lock everyone else behind the prisons, the prison bars of guilt, shame, regret, and offense. The moment you step out, you bring everyone with you. 
That's our responsibility as Jesus followers. Now we share the wealth. So who are you holding offense against? Forgiveness means we waive the right to hold a wrong against someone. Unforgiveness is drinking poison, hoping it kills the other person. It's locking yourself into prison, thinking it'll trap them. But when you're set free, in forgiveness, you share that open door experience with others. How? You just make a commitment to do it. That's right, you make a decision. Some of you, you're wanting some deep therapeutic experience right now. I'm just gonna tell you, it's gonna begin because you make a decision to forgive others. And then once you make that decision, you start acting on the decision. You talk different about them. You tell the story different. You treat them different. And then you pray that the feelings start to follow that. Decision, action, feelings. And I can't promise you the feelings will ever come, but I can tell you that the open door of forgiveness is from God alone and it's right. So now I want you to pause. Where right now are you trapped behind the closed door? For some of you, you've lived your life here behind shame and guilt, judgment and pain. And today for the first time, you're gonna say, yes, Jesus, I believe in you and I receive your forgiveness and I'm gonna step through that door. And if that's where you're at, can I just encourage you? This silly little metaphor, hey, somebody built this for us. We are so grateful, thank you. But you know, if, if, a, if a little illustration can help this stick in your mind and you're willing to step through that door into forgiveness from God alone through faith in Jesus, can I encourage you to make this your moment? And if that's your moment, it's literally, it's not words, it's not a little prayer, it's the confession of your heart that says, Jesus, I believe you died and rose again for me. Would you forgive me of sin and give me new life? For others of you, you've received forgiveness from God through faith in Jesus, but you're slamming the door on others. And it's now beginning to register in your heart. I need to extend that forgiveness to others. If that's where you're at, can you take this moment right now? for all of us. We believe that God's spirit is with us and his spirit wants to interact with our spirit. So at that level, would you take a moment, would you just pray? Would you allow God to speak to your heart? We hope that you've enjoyed today's experience. We also hope that this message has challenged you and will encourage you in the upcoming week. And if you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ today, congratulations, welcome to the family and welcome home. One of the most important first steps that you can take is by letting us know. You can click the prayer tab or you can visit us at lifehousechurch.org. And if this message or ministry has blessed you in any way, feel free to partner with us financially. You can click on the Give tab or you can visit our website and click Give. We are so thankful that you joined us and we are thankful that you are part of our extended family. We can't wait to see you back here next week.